Technological evolution is exponentially fast, and biological evolution is notoriously slow, which leads to the question if technology will or is overtaking us. You know, both work with a combinatorial logic that we talked about in different parts and other in other lectures before. So Mother Nature also just recombines building blocks that she puts together in, in her the blind watchmaker and the tireless tinkering, and then see what innovation actually fits. And that she does blindly, and every once in a while finds something that actually creates fit that fits. Uh, engineers are a little bit faster than that, it seems, with their design and have created artificial solutions, some to the same problem. So for example, Mother Nature came up with that solution to solve the problem of thinking and engineers came up with artificial intelligence. So what happens if the technology overtakes us in intelligence, for example? That is known as the technological singularity. And the technological singularity is the point when Machines are more intelligent than we are. They understand just more about the reality around us than we are and what happens then. And we don't know what happened when technological singularity hits. I mean, Hollywood movies would say the Terminators come and first of all, get rid of us or, or the Matrix, you know, the machines use us as, as batteries and keep us in boxes just to take the energy from us, like in the Matrix. But most people say, well, probably the machines won't even care. If you are in higher intelligence, why would you, if you don't, as long as we don't do a lot of harm, we don't even understand what they are doing, why would we care? For example, the analogy here is with ants. Do we as humans really care about this extinguishing all and killing all ants? I mean, ants have certainly a lower intelligence than we do, but, you know, it's no like, why would we waste all, as long as they don't get in our way? I mean, when we build a freeway, we don't care about them and we just build that freeway, but an ant doesn't really understand what this freeway actually is and what we're doing here. I mean, it's not intelligent enough to understand. So that's the question. If we have artificial intelligence that's beyond our intelligence, we won't understand what it's doing. It just, you know, it's just like building freeways for like, like for an ant. And it's like, okay, so I, I don't know. And and But why would the AI actually, like the positive outlook would be like, why would they bother to plug in the terminators to get rid of all of us. I mean, just let us live our ants life. So that would be an outlook. And so you know, even the most positive outlook say like something, something, you know, something critical will happen here. And the question is, when is the technological singularity here? And we've been playing this game for a long time. Uh, Ray Kurzweil calls it the game that only humans can so and we've been playing this game that, no, 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 it's not there yet. The technological singularity is not there yet because only humans can play chess, like the machine could not. And until the 1990s, that was kind of like the mantra. Most people did not think and everybody was on the edge with, it was, I think the title of the newspaper was The Last Stands of Humankind. We sent our best, Kasparov, to play against this machine, Deep Blue from IBM, and well, we lost it. But then it was like, okay, no, okay, so chess, that's just brute force, little thing, but what is with Go? That's a, an ancient Asian game similar to chess, but you cannot solve it by brute force. There are too many possibilities. So you need this uniquely human thing, this gut feeling, this intuition, this creativity that actually m machines can also do. So, so that went down. They said, okay, 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 so chess and Go, these are just, mathematical things, but what's with something qualitative? What about the qualitative aspects like an image? Recognizing and interpreting an image, uh, that is really qualitative. Machines can not, okay, then 2015, you said, okay, so what's with voice? I mean, voice, the voice of a mother for children. How could machine, this is really qualitative. This is out in 2016, that went down. They said, okay, so faces. We are biologically programmed and learn to recognize a mother's face because like, all right, that also went down. And, and here we go. And more recently, you know, only humans can pass high school AP English essay class. No, they, artificial intelligence now can as well. And it seems like in the more recent past, we have 
uh, stop playing the games only humans can, and now we play it versus machines. So the GPT-Y outperforms the GPT-X on a human task that actually is above what most of us can do. <laughs> so is the technological singularity here or is it not here? The metaphor that people use is the metaphor of a boiling frog. So they talk a metaphor, so the idea of the people will drop that in a conversation. You're just like talking with people and then it's like, yeah, it's kind of like the boiling frog. What does that actually mean? Well, it turns out that if you have a frog and you try to, you know, bring him close to boiling water, the frog will certainly not try to go in. It will climb away. So that the frog was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm not going into this, in, into this boiling water. It completely understands what's going on. Now, when you put a frog into cold water and then slowly raise the heat, guess what will happen? The frog will actually not move. The frog just sits there and it's kind of like, at the end, will get boiled. Now, no frog, got hurt in this experiment. But that is the, that's the metaphor people drop when they talk about this. It's like the boiling frog. Are we, are we kind of like the frogs already in the boiling water? And this gradual advancement is already taking place. Well, it's difficult to say because exponential progress is so brutal. We talked a lot about in a previous lecture how exponential progress is really difficult for humans to judge. We think, we think linearly. And exponential, you can convert that always into a doubling logic. It would mean that we make as much progress in the next period as we've done since the beginning. So let's go maybe to the beginning of the digital paradigm. That's how the digital paradigm was back in the Palo Alto Research Center computer, and, and that's how we played Pong. Now, if you say it doubles, and it doesn't matter if you say it doubles every two years, every year, every three years, every in the exponential, the long run, in the asymptote, it doesn't really matter in what frequency it doubles. Important is that it's exponential, that it doubles. Then whatever the next period is, X number of years, you would double it and you would get here, what well, the CAOs of the most valuable companies in the 2020s tell you what's, what's going on right now in, in whatever in the metaverse. And when you were back there in 1975, and you could have predicted this, it's the same as you predict what will happen in the next doubling rate, which is probably the next two, three years. And that nobody back here predicted the metaverse. Actually, it, it was really difficult to predict what was going on there. And that exponential progress makes it so difficult to make prediction and to understand what's going on. That's why the metaphor of the boiling frog is very apt. We're kind of like sitting there. So actually, because how that happens is the progress happens you know, in smaller steps. So here, that's, that's what digital technology looked like when I was playing video games as a kid, when Microsoft Windows just came onto the scene and Pac-Man was around. Uh, then here it became already much better. We had some role-playing games. It's still, it's still not the metaverse, but we had some role-playing games, Monkey Island, SimCity, Lara Croft. Then 10 years later, Lara Croft looked much better. We had some interaction, much higher resolution. The mobile revolution started. And then here, the 2015s, we had video games that cost a billion dollars. And, you know, back in the 2020s, going all the way back there. Now we come to the evolution of the metaverse where 30 million people meet together in a virtual place. So this was an example of the evolution of digital technology with regard to, you know, you can also see graphics and in virtual presence, how that evolved. It's very difficult now to say like, this continues to double in the next two, three years. Where will we end up? You would have to go back to the Atari 1970s and you're gonna see that much addition to, to technological progress. And that makes it really difficult to predict what will happen next period. And I cannot predict here, but we can ask the experts. So we ask the expert until when, what's the time until true artificial intelligence will arrive? And we ask them and we ask, we use, actually we ask many of them and then we have a hundred different, this is 95 different timeline predictions put all together. Most of them would agree of the experts that it will arrive in the next 16 to 25 years. So around 20 years. So most of them say like, okay, we still have about 20 years and then true artificial intelligence will arrive. And these are the expert predictors. And if we ask the non-experts, 
you know, just the rest of us, they also they also actually agree. I mean, some of them say it will never arrive and that how was it with the experts? Also, some say it will never arrive, but they also agree the distribution on average, most people, experts or not, would expect that true artificial intelligence will arrive in 20 years. Now, these surveys have actually been done from the 1950s to the 2010, these 100 surveys. That means in the 1950s, on average, people predicted True AI will come in 20 years, in the 60s, in the 70s, and in the 80s, they predicted exactly the same thing. True AI will come in 20 years. And as of most recent, probably if you look up the most recent prediction, they probably still say the same thing. <laughs> That's what happens when you stay on an exponential curve. Actually, it looks kind of like linear and we are really bad in making these predictions. So my answer to the so the question is, is the singularity here? It's like, it's really difficult to say. We don't, we don't know. We are more like the boiling frog and we should be aware. But what we do know is that most of the predictions we, we, we most often get wrong. And I want to end today's session with that. What does the future hold? I don't know. You know, the commissioner of the U.S. Patent Office said in 1899 that everything that can be invented has been invented. And he shut that office down. Literally. He shut the U.S. Patent Office in uh, down out there in New York. I have to check that. But in 1899, because according to him, you know, everything, I couldn't imagine that anything new could be invented. Century, 20th Century Fox said, television won't be able to hold on any market it captures after the first six months. People will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. That was in 1946. <laughs> Man, were they wrong and good for 20th Century Fox that they were wrong. Right. Thomas Watson, IBM CEO, think, I think there will be a, there's a world market for maybe five computers. That was in 1943. Also good for him that he was wrong. Right? IBM sold much more. And there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home, said founder of Digital Equipment Corporation. Also good for him that he was wrong. And some things... Lucky that we are wrong. Nuclear power vacuum cleaners will probably be a reality within 10 years. Well, glad that that never happened. That was in 1955. And Bill Gates famously said, two years from now, spam will be solved. That was in 2004. Well, I got some spam calls right today. So I, like, it's, it's not been solved two years from 2004. So what I can say, exponential technological progress makes it really difficult to, to make the predictions of what's left uh, for us humans. And in the first course of this specialization, in the second session, we already talked about how artificial intelligence is or might affect employment and how difficult it is to make predictions. Please go there and check that out to talk where we talk more about the F F impact of, te of this current technological program progress with artificial intelligence on the human labor market. But instead of repeating myself here and going back there, I want to leave you with probably the best advice we ever got and how to predict the future. It's Arthur Clarke's Laws of the Future. They are from 62, 1962. Arthur Clarke, one of the most prolific sci-fi authors. And sci-fi has been very important to predict the future because sci-fi often creates the future. Satellites, for example, have first been conceptualized in science fiction, and then the engineers are like, it's a cool idea, let's figure that out. So reading science fiction is a first good step. And Arthur Clarke's famous laws of the future hold the following. When an elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he's very probably wrong. <laughs> so check myself there, right? Second, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible, therefore, is then venture a little way past them into the impossible. So you have to venture into the impossible. Oh, that's impossible. But that's the only way you can test the limits of the possible. And third of all, and most important, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If only a few years ago, you would have said, like, you know, I'm learning by watching a video recording at I don't know what time a day and I can actually get a certificate that helps me for my job and for my curriculum and people really respect that I finished this specialization and, and took this course and I have this as if people would say like, no, that's not, that's not it, right? And maybe they could have imagined that. But then you told them, and you know what? Right when I was finished with that, I had a video conference with somebody on the other part of planet Earth. If you would have told that to somebody, maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, they would have said, no, no, that's like, if you would have done that back then, they said, that's magic. 
That's magic. How can you talk with somebody who's like, this is magic? And future technology will be the same thing. And I'll leave you with that. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. We have to venture way past the possible, a little bit into the impossible. And that's the best way we can predict the future. That's what I would have had to say about technological change. And I see you next time. Thank you very much for going on this exploration together with me.